Okay, here is the background lecture on Pygmalion and really the very end of the Victorian era. Before we start talking about the period, let's talk a little bit about drama. So far, we've read a lot of poetry, we've read some novels, we haven't really talked about drama. And that's because until the very end of the 19th century, the 19th century is not a great era for dramatic literature. There's a lot of melodrama, there's a lot of sentimental plays, um, but there really isn't a lot of great literature produced until the very end. Um, you are having, con you know, reproductions of Shakespeare, you know, um, play reproductions of older plays like Restoration Theater, but we're not getting great new original work until the like very end of the 19th century when we have an explosion of great drama that's connected to the movement of realism. We see this movement of realism in the novel, right? Depicting daily life as it really is. <clears throat> and we see it in theater as well. And then we'll see these, uh, they're called problem plays uh, that examined a particular social or political problem. So this is very kind of socially conscious drama. And this is an international movement. These playwrights, Ibsen, Pinero, Wilde, Shaw, right? Wilde is Irish, living in England. Um, they're not all English. So this is happening all over the place, all over Europe, essentially. So Ibsen writes A Doll's House, which is about women's position in society. He writes Ghosts, which is about syphilis, sexually transmitted diseases, and the problems that, that those cause in society. Pinero's The Second Mrs. Tanqueray and Wilde's Lady Windermere's Fan address both the issues of a, a woman having a sexual past, um, an illegitimate child, things like that. Shaw's play Mrs. Warren's Profession is about a woman who is a prostitute, but she ends up making a lot of money and, and ha she has a child, she has a daughter, she gives this daughter a wonderful life, a university education, the daughter is going to be a mathematician, um, and the, the conflict that occurs when the daughter understands what her mother does for a living. Um, <clears throat> so these plays take on all of these kinds of social issues, and they're about real people in their, in their daily lives. So this is the context for Pygmalion. And you can see that in Pygmalion, right? Um, the kind of the social issue is about education and class stigma in British society. But we see real people like Eliza is a flower seller going around her, her, her daily life. Okay, what time is this? Kind of like the Enlightenment, there are a number of names for this period, depending on where you are. If you are in America, we call this the Gay 90s or the Gilded Age, robber barons, etc. If you are in England, it actually has a French name. It is called the Fin de Siècle, the end of the century. But that is oddly not the name that it is in France. In France, it is called the Belle Epoque the beautiful, beautiful period. What's consistent here, right? This like gilded, beautiful, right? There's a, it, this is a time of peace and prosperity and a lot of money. So we're ending the 19th century with this period of peace and prosperity, kind of very similar to the 1990s, right? Peace, prosperity, we're ending the century. So, but you should definitely write these down because this is the kind of question that might be on a quiz or a test. The Edwardian era. We are <clears throat> technically, we're not in the Victorian period anymore. Victoria dies in 1901. She's succeeded by her son. However, it, there's not a real difference not a huge difference between this and the Victorian era. So this usually just kind of gets subsumed into Victorian literature. But again, a time of peace and prosperity, a real focus on leisure and the pursuit of pleasure. We do have a couple of wars. The Boer War is there. Uh, it's in Africa. 
it doesn't happen in England. And we will talk a lot more about World War One when we get to modernism. But one of the things that we want to think about is with this okay, peace, relative peace, lots of prosperity, the technology and progress of the Victorian era really comes home in a lot of great ways for people that technology is used to make personal living easier, right? We have the telephone, we get the automobile, we get electricity, we get indoor plumbing, um, we get all these kinds of technological advances that don't like build a great industry like they did, you know, in the earlier part of the 19th century, but they make daily life easier, better. So this is really kind of a golden age. There are also important political and social movements at this time, the end of the Victorian era going into the Edwardian era. Increased support for education. Compulsory public education for children five to 10, 1870. Before that, say that seven-year-old could have been working in a factory, but now we have public education for the working class and the middle class. So really expanding education for people. And women, we get higher education for women. Colleges like Oxford and Cambridge, I should say universities like Oxford and Cambridge, get women's colleges where women can go attend classes and they can do everything but get the actual degree, right? They won't get the actual degree until the 1920s, but they can get the education and attend the classes. And so we start to have more integrated, less sex segregated, higher education. And this will be very important. We also have Fabian socialism. This promoted the goals of socialism through peaceful democratic reforms rather than revolution. And this is important for Pygmalion because Shaw is a member of the Fabian Society. He is a socialist. He really espouses these goals. And you can see these ideals in the kind of class consciousness in the play. So also you can, you can think about the stuff for education, um, how important education is in the play. Obviously, the role of women is also important in Pygmalion. And as we go into the back half of the 19th century leading into the Edwardian century, we can see this develop. When we talked about Jane Eyre, we talked a little bit about um, how hard it was to get a divorce, like why Rochester can't divorce Bertha. Well, 1857, we get the Matrimonial Causes Act that makes divorce available to the middle class. Now, we do have a double standard the double standard is written into the law for men they just had to prove that their wife had committed adultery adultery is not alone a grounds for divorce for women women had to prove first that their husband had committed adultery and also he had either committed incest um bigamy uh he was cruel like domestic abuse or desertion he had abandoned them. So we do have a double standard, but it still gives divorce to the middle class. We had also talked a little bit about this demographic change in England, where you get a kind of a bunch of women without um, more women than men. And if your society is built to say that the role of a woman is to be a wife and a mother, that there are no men to marry, that becomes a problem. It's called the redundant woman problem. So we get this article by W.R. Gray, like, why are women redundant? And they had all these kinds of solutions, like maybe we could ship some women to Australia and they could marry all the guys who were there. Nobody wanted to do this. <clears throat> but another solution, you can see this, how this kind of complements the rise of education. Well, maybe women could do things other than being wives and mothers. They could get educations and they could start having careers. 1867, John, the political philosopher John Stuart Mill, also known for On Liberty, writes The Subjection of Women, where he talks about how women are treated as second class citizens in the society and essentially argues for expanded rights for women. I say John Stuart Mill, I should also say it's also by Harriet Taylor. She helped write a lot of this. She was his lover, um, <clears throat> but she was never uh, officially attributed authorship. 
1870-1882, the Married Women's Property Acts were very important because they established uh, more rights for married women to own property, write contracts, uh, dispose of property and things like wills and such. So this gave married women more rights to, and more independence, right? More economic independence by being able to own and control their own property. So you can see this progression of kind of rights for women, right? More availability of divorce, recognition that women are probably, are probably, not probably, are second class citizens, that they need to have economic independence. And this all kind of starts to culminate in the 1890s with this new type of woman, a new figure, a new, a new kind of person, which is called the new woman, capital N, capital W. And the new woman wanted things like she wanted to live in her own apartment by herself. She wanted to go to college and get an education. She might want a career. Um, she wanted to dress differently and in a kind of less restrictive kind of fashion. She did things like ride bicycles. So she had independent means of transportation. Um, she also rode auto buses, right, independently. Um, basically women who wanted the, the right and the ability to have a different kind of lifestyle, a more independent, solitary lifestyle, where you have freedom of movement, freedom, freedom of education, freedom for career, we would call these people feminists. And they were treated in their society, much like feminists are treated in our society. They were criticized a lot for not adhering to traditional gender roles. They were seen as objects to make fun of. Um, just these, who are these, who are these crazy women with their crazy, crazy ideas? So <clears throat> we get the new woman. We also, you can see this all leading up to campaign for political rights for women, the women's suffrage movement, two major um, political organizations, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies and the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU. These organizations um, advocated, they demonstrated, they protested, they lobbied, they um, worked very hard for women's suffrage, for the right to vote. These are the suffragettes. So you can, and you can kind of see how the new woman would become the suffragette. And you know, they, they threw bricks through windows, they had parades, they had protest marches, they had hunger strikes, they had all kinds of different political tactics that they used to demonstrate for the, the right of women to vote in elections. Um, so the suffrage movement will be going strong um, from the end of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century. Um, they kind of hit pause on the suffrage movement during World War I. They kind of suspend their uh, very, some of their very divisive activities during World War I, but we get the suffrage movement. And so that is important as well. <clears throat> 